12 minutes. Okay, let's watch this guy's video. This why I wonder if it's gonna be the same like Mihawk is Shaki, Shaki, Shakiyuka, and uh, Rayleigh's uh, bastard. Well, it wouldn't be bastard. They're married. Child. Let's see. Which of these personal care brands would you consider buying? None, because I don't shower or use the other. This is Fuck the strangest you. Mihawk theory you have ever seen. In fact, it might even be just the strangest theory you've ever seen, full stop. But the truth is often strange. Okay, that's theory. gonna be hard. That's gonna be hard. I've seen some crazy ones. And I had people come up with crazy ones in my uh, videos before, so we'll see. But if it is fictional pirate truth. And in three short steps, <laughs> I am going to convince you that Drake Mihawk is not what he seems. And he is, in fact, a completely different kind of something. Notice how I said something. Something instead of someone that's foreshadowing. Speaking of strange truths, this video came uh. about because both I and another YouTuber named Parvision stumbled upon the same idea that Vanderdecken is a literal mushroom. I have a whole video on Dude in a Room explaining that situation if you care. But in okay, recognition that's pretty of our crazy. madness, this is something of a collaboration. You can see the original idea on his channel. It goes into a lot of the finer details, and you can even hit that funky red subscribe button while you're there because he's a pretty cool dude. Plus, here's the video cited in APA just to make sure that there's no credit confusion this time. But step one for blowing your Mihawk mind brains. All objects have a will. One Piece is a strange series for many, many reasons. But one that always sticks out to me is the fact that Roger was able to eavesdrop on conversations between rather large stone cubes. The voice of all things. Like literally all of the things have a voice and some people can hear them. Now in reality, that would be cause for concern. But in One Piece, that, that makes you the Pirate King. This extends further into the concept of the breath of all things, which famously allowed Zoro to cut steel due to the rather creepy concept that all objects were breathing heavily onto him. But also, many objects have unique personalities. Etchiro Oda loves personification and has given personalities to a wide range of items, including Luffy's straw hat, Kaido's club, and even Yamato's side boob. Granted, these are mostly what? a comical <laughs> effect. Or are they? Well, yes, obviously. Never heard that. can be both funny and relevant at the same time. It's like the entire premise of my channel, I hope. For example, Oda's personified Wadawichi Shimonji takes on the appearance of a young Shimotsuki Kozaburo, the man who crafted both it and Enma. Now we currently have yet to see Enma personified, or have we? Look, maybe. One of the big mysteries remaining after the end of Onikishima was the Grim Reaper encountered by Zoro. Now, the popular train of thought at the moment is either one, Zoro be trippin', or two, that this is the spirit, will, or personification of Enma manifesting. And I still think it was Brooke. He was seeing Brooke rescue him, and he thought it was the death coming to take him away. But that's my theory. And Parvision in his video mentions that this thought is starting to taste a bit like bleach, which, you know, isn't great, because that's a substance. Oh, tasting like bleach. Oh, burn. Women should not ingest. But this leads nicely into step two of our three part master plan to ruin your mind brain. But first, I have a dog. And I wanted to make my dog a very flamboyant Scottish lord. A very unique problem, I'll admit. Oh just... no, we're, we're not gonna have this in my video. Oh my god, did y'all not hear all the drama about these? Oh, guess what? Guess what, guys? If you buy this, you're not gonna really be a fucking real lord. It, 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 did you think it was? I mean, I guess some fucking people did. I don't want to drop. I don't really give a fuck, but I just think it's funny. Works with global charities on restoration efforts. For aside for a second, this bold statement is actually old news. Scientists oh, like what? Vega Punk or Hungry Hags. Putting Enma aside for a second, ruin your mind, brain with the channel. So do that thing, but for now it's back to you. Me. But this leads nicely into step two of our three-part master plan to ruin your mind brain, which is objects can come to life. Putting Enma aside for a second, this bold statement is actually old news. Scientists like Vegapunk or hungry hag sorcerers like Big Mom have been finding ways to imbue objects with life since long before your father decided to imbue your mother with you. However, Parvish... No, not in my case. ...completely forgotten about, which is like a whole new... I'm actually older than One Piece, so fuck off. ...here of this delicious theory lasagna. And it's a starfish. His name is Papug. Say hi to Papug, please. And in One Piece chapter number, this one, Papug explains his origins as having believed he was a human when he was a child. However, by the time he found out that Gaspy was a starfish, it was too late to change. Going on to state, the mind is a powerful thing. In this world, you can do anything you put your mind to. Oh my god, is One Piece gonna turn out to be an entirely dream? And that's what the D stands for, people that are dreaming this? And we cut out after the end of One Piece and it's Luffy dreaming about it the whole time 
Fapag then went on to walk the talk that he'd been talking about and became a successful entrepreneur with his criminal brand, which Nami claims are sold for criminal prices. And something more recent that cements willpower as the greatest force of this world is obviously Gear 5th, which has brought up all kinds of questions about the power of the imagination and just how limitless one's potential is with the right willpower. It actually makes sense that Oda would go this route, like imagination. I mean, he's a fucking artist. Mangaka creates things. So I could definitely see him wanting to associate imagination being the most powerful thing. Can create anything. Because technically imagination is what, is what created Luffy. It was Oda's a fucking imagination the whole fucking time. Does imagination start with a D in Japan? Like, is the word like duh duh, you know? It. Granted, Papug was never an object. He was always a living thing, but by that same logic, so are all of the other quote-unquote objects who factually have their own wills and personalities. And the obvious example of that is the Going Merry. That ship was 100% alive, and not only that, but it managed to manifest its own physical presence in the Club Alto, oh, something that was able to physically repair and otherwise interact with the world. Merry had a very benevolent and caring personality. However, when we turn to the world of swords, things, uh, things get a bit more volatile. The Sunday Hey, <laughs> it's the hurry. You. Got some place to be? Yeah. Well, not happy to see me. Well, no love for that, <laughs> no, I'm late, okay? Oh, I know. I want my deposit back. I wish I could, but... Daikitetsu was famously referred to by Zoro as a quote problem child and had a habit of throwing a bit of a hissy fit whenever most people tried to wield it, thus leading to it and the rest of the Kitetsu set being labeled as cursed. It is true. Zoro he has kind of imbued specific. like inanimate objects with like persons like with like more than just like being inanimate like how it is in the real world a test for the sandai kitetsu to deem him worthy of using it for slice cutting but that that was nothing compared to enma's test because that sword that that allegedly inanimate object was ready to kill zoro if he was unworthy so my conclusion is that one swords swords are pricks and two the greater the quality of the sword the more intense the test to wield the sword and right now in the series there is no greater sword than drake your mihawks yoru yoru is actually by far the most iconic sword in all of One Piece. Its impact on pop culture can be seen through the Man at Arm series, deciding to forge a real Yoru, or even wow. the crafty Transformer forging his own cardboard Yoru. In fact, the only people who weren't in awe of Yoru were four kids, who decided to engage in the sword equivalent of circumcision by clipping down the cross guard. Which I imagine was because of, you know, crosses and Jesus and religion and such. But seeing Yoru like this is kind of like seeing a shaved German Shepherd. You were once a fearsome looking wolfen boy, but now you're just a six-piece bucket of family lols. I hope you enjoyed that joke because from here on out things are getting serious. Mr. Drakeel Mihawk, if that is indeed your real name, you are not what you portray yourself to be. Because all of our evidences bring us to step three of the master plan, which is the conclusion that Yoru is alive and Mihawk is actually a manifestation of the blade who exists to serve as a test to judge the swordsman worthy of wielding him. Okay, so I know I took some big leaps there. To be honest, it's because I thought having a three-step plan sounded much better than having a four or five-step plan. And having said that now all I can think about is what are you doing step plan but in mere minutes all of this is going to be shockingly plausible Step plan, I'm stuck, help! Plausible. Because something that no one has ever done, to the best of my knowledge, is look at the series through the perspective of Yoru. POV, you're Yoru. You're the greatest sharp object in the world, and you've spent an awfully long time waiting for someone to be worthy of wielding you. However, each and every candidate that has found you has been disappointing, to the point where you, as a sword, start to believe that the only person good enough for you is you. Yoru gets so sick and tired and bored of waiting that it manifests itself in order to seek out a worthy swordsman. It comes to life, and just like a 13 year old in their very first online game, it has to create a new name. In this case, let's say Dracula Van Hawk Slayer 69. Which, like all of our first handles, Yoru would come to regret and refine it to the more socially acceptable Dracul Mihawk. But the thing is, if you look at Mihawk with your eyes, the dude even looks like a sword. He has sharp eyesight, sharp facial hair, and of course, is a superbly sharp dresser. Very interestingly, the word Yoru means night. So when Knight is choosing a home for himself, Kuragana Island as a perpetually dark and gloomy environment is perfection. I mean, it has everything. Darkness, mandrills, more darkness, and even an impossible toilet. Not that Yoru, as a sword, probably defecates anyway. No, he more than likely just leaves the toilet there to confuse the... But he drinks wine. We've seen him drink wine. Yes. But really, if I'm Yoru, then all I need right now is a well-endowed goth waifu by my side, and we're all set to go. Set to go out into the world and discover a worthy swordsman, that is. And I think we all know just who Yoru found. 
His fiercest rival, Redhead Shanks, a swordsman whose duels with Mihawk sent echoes all throughout the Grand Line. Strong, skilled, and willed, everything was perfect until it wasn't. After an incident involving a rubber boy, a mountain bandit, and a big old sea snake, Shanks returned to the Grand Line, or I should say most of Shanks returned to the Grand Line. Roughly 10% of him remained behind in East Blue in the form of his left arm. And after this event, Yoro received what I can only imagine was the sword equivalent of blue balls. But why would that crush the idea of him challenging Shanks. I mean, the greatest swordsman in the world with one arm is still the world's greatest swordsman. Well, Parvision proposes it's because Yoru has a strict requirement that those who wield it must have two arms. Because to be fair, it is indeed a big boy sword and unlikely to reach its full potential just being swung a dung around one-handed. But after this, Yoru was distraught. He lost all hope of ever finding someone capable of passing its merciless test. And so he took up a position as a warlord of the sea and retired to a quiet life, tending to his cabbage farming. Those those cabbages, by the way, according to One Piece World logic, probably have wills and personalities of their own. I mean, just think about it this way. We all assume that Mihawk lives this very loner lifestyle, but in reality, Kuregana Island is absolutely packed with objects to talk to. Well, like Monkeys, cabbages. Cabbages, toilet. Mihawk has an abundance of friends around every corner, <laughs> and yet he still feels ever so empty because he's not fulfilling his true purpose as a sword. And so every now and then he ventures fruitlessly into the Grand Line, doing a slice slice here and a chop chop there until on one one fatesome day, he encountered the future world's greatest swordsman. So Parvision now points to a series of great lines by Kozaburo, Ipomatsu, and even Zoro himself. Let's read what Kozaburo said in chapter 1033 together real quick. He says, a great blade can see into you. It chooses only the swordsman who best suits it. Then we get Ipomatsu saying, a sword chooses its wielder. And then Zoro said that Enma chose him and is now testing him. In much the same way that Yoru found Zoro on that day in the irrelevant waters of East Blue, the Great Blade saw into Zoro and sought to test him. And Zoro passed that initial test, a test to see if his spirit and willpower were worthy. I mean, obviously his, his everything else was lacking, but yeah, that's fine, we, we can fix that. After which Mihawk says, strive with your whole heart and mind to best this blade, not best me best this blade. To be fair, immediately after that, Mihawk says surpass me, so I don't think we should read too much into Mihawk's flowery language. But he was drawn <clears throat> to Zoro. He saw through Zoro, and he said that he would wait for Zoro, which is exactly the sort of thing that a sword would say. A few months later, Zoro would rock up on Mihawk's doorstep and beg to be trained. And Mihawk has a bit of a chuckle, he did a bit of a ho 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 ho. But this could not be more perfect. A sword not only testing its user, but actively training its user to wield it. Which I actually imagine would have probably led to some unintentional homoeroticism with Mihawk saying stuff like, No, Zorokun, this is how you must grip me. Huh? I mean, this is how you must grip the sword. The sword is, is what I meant. But the test for the world's greatest blade was so brutal that even after two years of training, Zoro was still not ready. And so Yoru continued to mill around, just, you know, waiting patiently, having a bit of a fling with the goth waifu he'd previously wished for, and then subsequently being dumped by the world government and having to form an alliance with a clown. You know, you stand Standard sword problems, really. We've all heard the story before. And speaking of problems, does this theory have any? Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, it has its own Santorius worth of problems. One, we've seen Mihawk as a child. Two, we've seen Yoru personified by Oda. And three, the idea of Zoro using a two-handed blade just yeah, feels a bit off. However, to those, I say. One, the Merry Manifestation was also a child, so perhaps they can mature in form. Two, the personification of Yoru may just be based on the person who crafted it. Much like how Kozaburo made Enma, and yet its manifest station is potentially a Grim Reaper. And three, I like Zoro and I like swords, so I'm generally just happy if Zoro was cutting things, no matter what that blade is. And like person swords aside, I actually think it would be really cool to see Zoro use Yoru, even if it's only for a special and likely desperate occasion. But just to clarify, I do not take this idea seriously. Nor should anyone take what any One Piece YouTubers have to say seriously. Like that me. Legit, we are all just dudes in rooms. It's a really cool idea and the originator Parvision is a creator who Am I in a room or is the room me? Like, okay, maybe this room, the manifestation of this room is me. That is what happened. Okay? I am the room. Oh, hello, Mark. 
who specializes in having You're tearing me apart, Lisa. And in the end, One Piece isn't about the big epic reveals, the punch fighting or the mysteries. It's about enjoying the journey and the friends we made. Oh my God, in this no. Case, the friends Mihawk made along the way are monkeys, cabbages, and of course, good old toilet. So let's continue the journey now with this video, which you can watch while you're doing your dishes. So I look forward to seeing you there. Okay, that was interesting. That's pretty crazy. Okay, that was interesting. I think it's been some good shit. I'll have to do this some more. It's interesting. Like, I used to hate it because I didn't want to, like, steal people's theories, but, like, and, like, come off that they're not. But I was trying to always be up front with it when I would say something. Like, there's a big, like, do you know, like, the Reddit people fucking hate most of the YouTube people? Like, they fucking hate them because they're, like, Fucking, what is it, Grand Line Theory or O'Hara or ever who the fuck it is. Like, they fucking, they come to here and they steal our theories and blah, 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 blah. Because guess what? There are two types of people in this world. There are typers and there are talkers. And then when you make YouTube videos, you're a talker, you're not a typer. And then you're on Reddit, you're a typer and not a talker, right? Because it's 2022, if you could, you would make fucking videos, right? That's why I never really like blogs that was why when it was youtube i took to it because i am more of a talker i mean not that good a writer i can write shit and like i can even but like i'm not like the writing thing i can get my shit across more when i'm talking like these people this is what separates it like youtubers like there's just also there's also a big thing between like people like that stream versus people that make youtube videos and while a long time ago when I was making shit, streaming wasn't like it was now. Like, it wasn't, like, easy. It wasn't wet. They didn't have an OBS. You didn't have all this shit. Like, you could do some basic shit, right? But, like, you didn't have all this other tools, right? So, 99% of the time when I did my videos ever, I never had, like, a script. I might have had, like, an idea, something like that. Some people are good. They can write it and then perform it. Then there are people who can perform, but they can't write. Then there are people who can just write, but they couldn't do either one. Of course, you got people to just watch. But, like, see, I feel like I can encompass a lot. Like I, never, like I said, I never, I was always like to be off the cuff and to say what I said when I said it, right? I don't like to write down. But then, like, sometimes I would, like, be back. Because then I was also lazy about editing, you know? And, like, oh. So, like, it was a lot of shit like that, you know? So, yeah, that's the, so a lot of, like, Reddit people fucking can't stand the fucking YouTuber people. They hate the motherfuckers. I don't know, like, it's, it's kind of like now, like, I don't know who follows all the shit. There's, like, the AI art people that are, like, hating the fuck out of AI art. Like, there's, like, a, they're, like, people, like, and they're on Reddit, too, right? 